Welcome to the Code Octopus Breakwater Construction Webinar. Today we're delighted to welcome participants from across the world. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to attend and dial in to the webinar. We will be recording the webinar and this will be available on our website after the event. Code Octopus has been involved in a number of different breakwater projects across the world since 2008, principally as a sonar equipment supplier. Today, we thought it would be useful to bring together as many people as possible to discuss issues in breakwater construction and to highlight potential solutions. As a result of our involvement using our unique real-time 3D sonar system, the Echoscope, we have developed additional software to assist in the construction process and more of that later in the webinar. Today, we will look at the breakwater design process and the factors that drive the final design of the breakwater. We will look at the challenges during construction and how the, these are managed by the construction contractor before taking a run through the Code Octopus construction monitoring software. We'll then summarize the main points of the webinar before opening the floor to questions and answers. On your main screen, you will see a chat bar at the bottom of the screen. Please use this to submit your questions and please feel free to submit the questions as the webinar progresses. We will then compile the questions and answer them as efficiently as possible at the end of the webinar. We're delighted today to be joined by three very experienced presenters. Our presenters come from very different backgrounds, but they have in common an exceptional level of knowledge and experience in their own respective fields. Talking us through the breakwater design process is Dave Anglin from Baird & Associates. Dave is a senior coastal engineer with over 30 years experience in breakwater and coastal design projects. This experience was developed in projects across North America and overseas, and he specialises in the modelling and design of coastal and marine structures with significant experience in armoured breakwater projects. Dave uses the Baird approach, which utilises leading edge science, numerical and physical modelling in the design process, blended with their practical experience to develop cost effective solutions for their customers. We're also very pleased today to welcome Eric Peters from Van Oord. Eric has been a qualified surveyor since 1998 and has worked on various Van Oord projects for the past 14 years. These projects have included significant breakwater construction projects such as Dubai World Island, Raslafan, Masflik 2, Porta Constanza, and currently Eric is working on the Moyne Container Terminal in Costa Rica. During this time, Eric has developed a significant amount of experience in delivering the practical aspects of breakwater construction and he has used this experience to develop innovative survey techniques such as the survey crane Condor. Currently he is leading research with Van Oort to determine rock quantities with various different survey methods. And finally I would like to welcome our last presenter Blair Cunningham from Code Octopus. A software design specialist Blair has been with Code Octopus since 2004 and has been our president of technology since 2013. In his role, Blair oversees all of the Code Octopus software and hardware development. But more importantly, he has led our support to breakwater projects since 2008. These projects have included Raz Lafan, Masflake 2, and the Porta Constanza. And Blair has used this experience gained on these projects to develop our construction monitoring software. Before we start, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to Code Octopus. We are headquartered here in Edinburgh, where we locate our sales team, our software development team, and our operational support team, supporting projects 24-7 across the world. Code Octopus is part of the wider Code Octopus group, which includes two engineering design and manufacturing companies, Code Colmec, based in Salt Lake City in the US, and Code Martech, based in Portland in the UK. Through the group, we have the capability to supply innovative end-to-end -end solution to meet our customers' requirements. Code Octopus has a long history in the marine industry, supporting marine projects stretching back over 20 years. We currently produce three product lines, which range from our side scan and sub-bottom profiling 
acquisition hardware and post-processing software to our motion range of F-180 GNSS aided inertial navigation systems through to our range of real-time 3D sonar systems. This range now includes the dimension, the compact echoscope and the echoscope which is the system which has been used on a large number of breakwater projects across the world to date and we'll talk more about the echoscope later in the webinar. I'd now like to hand over to Dave who will talk us through the breakwater design process. My name is Dave Anglin and I'm a senior coastal engineer with Baird and Associates in Madison, Wisconsin. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, my presentation provides an introduction to rubble mound breakwaters and includes a summary of key design issues and an overview of the design process. So a quick outline of the presentation, I'll talk about project definition, a summary of the key design issues when looking at breakwaters, which include functional requirements, site conditions and coastal processes, and constructability. And then I'll provide an overview of the design process, including the design criteria and conditions, alternatives assessment, design development, and bidding and construction. So first, in terms of project definition, obviously a key input is the site location then the project objectives, its functions and purpose, and then the breakwater structure itself, its functions and performance criteria. The functional requirements, so the project type could involve any number of different types of projects, a port, harbor, marine or channel, shore protection or sea defense, or sometimes industrial intakes or outfalls. So the function of the breakwater can typically be described by uh, one of four things. It might be to provide wave protection, erosion or flood protection, sediment control and containment, or flow control. And an important input to the design process is cost versus risk. So typically, um, the capital cost will, an increased capital cost will result in a reduced risk of damage. Um, and in the trade-off between capital cost and risk, one needs to consider the implications of damage, which would typically include reduced functionality and the associated economic losses of damage or failure of the breakwater, the cost of repair or rehabilitation of the structure, and in some cases environmental impacts and loss of life. And generally for a breakwater those aren't big issues, but in the case of a sea dike uh, they could be significant issues. Site conditions and coastal processes. A comprehensive understanding of site conditions and coastal processes is critical to developing an appropriate breakwater design and ultimately to a successful project. In terms of site conditions, the key issues of interest are the bathymetry, the subsurface conditions and the seismicity of the site. If we talk about mid-ocean conditions, the key issues are waves, currents, water levels and in some parts of the world ice. In the mid-ocean conditions, it's very important to understand both the day-to-day -day or operational conditions as well as the extreme conditions. And then finally, coastal processes can be an important input to the design process, including nearshore hydrodynamics and sediment transport. Constructability is also a key consideration that should be addressed early on, investigated early on, as it has important impacts on cost. So first, this, there are various site considerations that, that could be important, including the presence of existing infrastructure, access to the site from either the land or the water, and the potential for weather-related downtime or damage during construction. Another important input to the design process is construction materials, and generally here we're talking about quarried stone and concrete. So the site proximity to quarries will be very important. The stone type, quality and size or the quarry yield are important inputs to the design process, and in the case of concrete armor units, uh, concrete design and the cement aggregates and water sources are all very important. And finally the equipment and experience to build the structure is a very important input to the design process. So these might include questions of local versus international contractors and also land versus marine based construction operations. So now if we talk about design criteria uh, and design conditions, Typically, the client would define the design life for the project and also the acceptable risk of damage or failure. And with those parameters defined, we can define the return period of the design event that the structure should be designed for. And then the other parameters that come into play here are the functional requirements of the structure, the water depths at the site, the subsurface conditions, and the wave conditions. 
and those parameters effectively define what may be viable structural concepts for the breakwater. These may include rubble mound, vertical, composite, or floating structures, or various other types of structures. Today we're going to talk about rubble mound structures. So with the, the breakwater, the need for the breakwater established and a rubble mound concept selected, um, this gives an overview of a rubble mound breakwater. So it's effectively a rock fill structure that's comprised of an armor layer, referred to as A here, uh, the outer layer which is designed to resist severe wave attack, sometimes ice action. There's a filter layer, F, intermediate between the armor and the core. The core typically represents the bulk of the volume of the breakwater and is a relatively inexpensive material, quarry run, shot rock. And then we also have a bedding layer at the base. So the core comprises the central section of the breakwater and the majority of the volume. The filter layer is required as an intermediate layer between the core and the armor to prevent the loss of fines from the core. And then the armor layer is designed to resist the wave action. The bedding layer is typically required where we have a sandy bottom and it provides a, basically a filter between the, the structure and the seabed. And then we also have a tow detail, which is required often to, to address the risk of scour. Now the armor layer, which is um, perhaps the most important element of the structure, typically may be either quarried stone or concrete armor units. And these two photos below show actually a test section on a rubble mound breakwater that has an armor stone cover layer and also the placement of concrete armor units on a breakwater over the filter layer. Very important uh, item to note is that the weight of the armor unit is proportional to the wave height cubed. So as we go into more exposed sites with larger wave heights, the armor size, whether it be armor stone or concrete armor units, will increase dramatically as the wave height increases. And ultimately what this means is that a conventional design with large armor stone becomes impractical, if not impossible, in exposed locations because of the excessive stone size that's required. That becomes an issue for quarrying, transport, and placement. So that leads to the use of concrete armor units, which use interlocking to reduce the unit weight, the individual weight of the unit that's required for stability. And that allows us to build breakwaters in more exposed locations than if we were just using stone. So the alternatives assessment, again, assuming that we're working with a rubble mound structure, then the first step is concept design and assessment of a number of alternatives. So this might include an armor stone structure with conventional armor layer, like a Hudson shore protection manual design, or a berm layer, which is a wider layer of armor stone that typically the stone can be smaller than in a conventional design. The other option is concrete armor units, and this figure shows a number of alternative concrete armor units. Um, they're referred to as massive blocks, like like the um, just a concrete cube or an antifer cube, bulky units like the acropod, the core lock, and the X block, and then more slender units like the tetrapod and the dolos. And the selection of armor units is, is beyond the scope of this presentation. Other inputs to the design would be the side slopes, the crest elevation and detail, whether or not you need access on the completed structure, and also the toe detail. So we go through a process to design some alternatives, and then we would take, make a comparative assessment of these alternatives uh, in the, under a number of headings or, or uh, evaluation parameters, such as cost, including both capital and maintenance cost, the design certainty. Or, or risk associated with the design, the anticipated performance of the design, the risk or implication of non-performance, constructability, and also environmental impacts. And following that assessment or through that assessment, we would lead to the identification of a preferred concept or maybe a preferred concept and an alternative. And with that concept in mind, we would then go into the design development phase, excuse me, where we start with practical experience and also desktop and empirical analysis to look at various components of the breakwater, uh, probably starting with the armor layer stability, looking at filter and bedding layer requirements, the tow detail and scour protection, the level of protection required against wave run-up overtopping and transmission, which is principally dictated by the crest elevation, and finally the requirement for a crest structure, an access structure, or a structure to provide access on the crest of the structure. 
Uh, and then that typically leads into physical modeling. And physical modeling is really the best tool available to assess wave structure interaction. It's recommended for large projects and it's essential for unique and complex projects. And what a physical model does for us, it, it allows us to clearly demonstrate the performance of the structure. It's a very visual design tool. It allows for design refinement and opti optimization that's not otherwise possible through desktop or numerical modeling procedures. And that re design refinement or optimization can lead to significant cost savings. These photos show uh, a physical model, a 1 to 50 scale physical model of a port that we built in, designed and built in Madagascar. This is the Rubble Mound Breakwater. It's about 600 meters long. And then this is a picture of the completed uh, breakwater with a ship unloading, sh a ship unloader at the site. So the final design, plans and specs, is sort of the last phase of the design process. So the final design involves the review and assimilation of all the design analysis and modeling that were done, so the site investigations, uh, wave climate studies, the physical modeling. This step also includes the optimization of key structural components and also the identification and definition of specific design details such as transitions and terminations between cross sections. This leads into the plans and specifications for the project and really they, their, intent, that their purpose is to communicate the intent of the design to the contractor and also a critical factor is to minimize the risk of disputes and claims during construction. So now we jump into construction. So just a few general comments first. One, that the quality construction is essential to long-term performance. So a good design is not sufficient. It also needs to have good construction. And poor construction can result in damage or failure of a structure. Uh, key issues for construction. So on the material side of things, the stone size, shape, and quality are critical to the success of a project. Poor quality stone can degrade in service and create problems. Undersized stone is not as stable, it can create problems. And then in the context of concrete armor units, the mixed design and the quality of the concrete are very important. As we know, concrete is very weak in tension, so good quality concrete that provides some tensile resistance is important because typically these armor units are not reinforced. Uh, key issues relative to placement or the filter layer, the filter layer needs to be well built to provide a good base for the armor layer to be placed on top of it. And also the toe detail is, is a critical element on the structure, in particular for single layer armor units like core locks, acropods, and X blocks, the toe detail is absolutely critical to the overall stability of the structure. And then the armor layer itself, its placement is, is in addition to the size of the armor stone or armor units, their placement is critical to the stability of the structure. And if we, for the case of armor stone, a tight interlock placement is, is essential. And the place of concrete armor units, such as the X block, the core lock, and the acropod, the placement grid, the interlock between the units, and the orientation are all important. So, Construction, there are a number of aids to construction that a, a design engineer might have to assist the process, assist the contractor, and the first of these overall is a quality assurance and quality control program, which would typically include a, a, in a resident project representative at the quarry and also at the site. Then in terms of the, the operations at the site, uh, surveys are obviously an essential part of building a breakwater, and this can involve the use of batter boards as well as construction surveys that would typically be done by the contractor to aid his construction and also verification surveys that are done with the engineer or the uh, client's representative to confirm that the structure has been built as required and meets the specified lines and grades. And then there are a number of placement aids that can come into use or and are in use for breakwater construction. The first of these is divers and particularly in the case of concrete arm units Divers have been used to confirm placement and interlocking between units. Obviously, there's a cost and a safety issue with divers, and in some areas, the use of divers is impossible. Uh, more recently, uh, the use of differential GPS has come into uh, use in the construction of breakwaters, 
where the the boom of the crane would have a differential GPS so you could have a, an indication of where the units are placed. And the most recent tools that have recently evolved are construction monitoring systems such as the posi block and the echoscope, which is the focus of this today's or the subsequent talks today. So that's a quick introduction to the key issues in the process involved in the design of a breakwater. Um, I hope that was a useful overview and I would uh, look forward to any questions or comments. Thank you very much. The growing world population needs more space and the demand for energy is rising constantly. Increasing world trade requires more and better port facilities and climate changes is threatening coastal areas. Van Noord provides innovative solutions for these worldwide marine engineering challenges, both now and in the future. Van Noord has a long marine engineering history which dates back to 1886 when Govert van Noord set up as an independent entrepreneur dealing in marine materials and laid a foundation for the van Noord business. Marine engineering has its roots in the Netherlands and its reputation is known throughout the world. We have been involved in countless breakwater construction projects, both with and without single layer concrete armor units. Recent projects include the Constanza port expansion project in Romania and Moin in Costa Rica. We are facing challenges like varying soil conditions and sea conditions and strict construction requirements related to seismic activity. Together with our clients we are also discussing important environmental topics because no matter how fast we need to carry out the construction works we don't want to have an adverse impact on the environment and cause damages to residents, nature, marine life, wildlife etc. For all involved, safety and sustainability are leading items on our corporate agendas. The port of Constanza is Romania's main port and is located at the crossroads of trade routes. It's also the largest port on the Black Sea. Guaranteeing a safe entrance to the port is essential. Although the port of Constanza is protected by two breakwaters, strong winds still sometimes manage to create high waves in the port basin. The extension of the existing northern breakwater by 1050 meters will reduce the swell and increase the safe entrance for ships calling in at the port, as well as minimize the negative impact the waves have on the port facilities. Van Oort was awarded the contract to extend the northern breakwater. One of the main challenges Van Oort encountered was the connection between the existing breakwater and the new extension. The extension of the breakwater will be constructed using rock, several sizes of acropods and concrete. The majority of the material was transported to the project by maritime transport in order to avoid encumbering the already heavy city and port traffic. The side stone dumping vessel France and additional hopper barges were used to accurately place more than 3 million tons of stone in water depths up to minus 26 meters. The acropodes, some 16,000 in total, were produced on site and from the outer layer of the breakwater. One of Van Oort's largest backhoes was used to shape the underlayer and place the 9 and 12 cubic meter acropodes on the water. The remaining acropodes were placed by land-based equipment. Now the construction rises 10 meters above the sea level, including the crown wall. The most common way of placing concrete armor units is by using a crawler crane or hydraulic excavator provided with a sling or chain in which the armor unit can be lifted into place. The disadvantages of these placing methods 
are the relative large motions of the armor unit in the horizontal plane, uncontrolled rotation of the unit when using a crawler crane, inability to rotate the unit when using a hydraulic excavator, and unsafe working situations due to direct human interaction during placing. Since the start of the Rasla van Norden breakwater project, Van Noord has been focusing on a working method and placing system to increase the production rates, whilst at the same time improving the safety environment by reducing the physical human interactions. These two basic starting points resulted in the development of an unconventional and innovative placing system. The innovative solution developed by Van Noord was threefold. Considering the overall production schedule of the project, the choice was made to use hydraulic excavators to obtain higher production rates and accuracy compared to crawler cranes, conventionally used for the placement of aquapods on the water. A rotator system was developed to be able to rig and rotate the aquapod in multiple ways and to have it released by the operator. This way the need for divers and riggers to assist with rotating and releasing the aquapod during placement was avoided. Whilst it's normal practice for divers and riggers to assist in the placement of aquapod with crawler cranes, this inevitably increases the safety risks. Based on experiences during previous projects and the dangers involved, the use of divers for placement and inspection below the waterline was to be minimized. Here too, the excavators were equipped with an echoscope system and underwater cameras to provide the crane operator with a subsea view of the unit in the breakwater section under construction. Through collaboration between Van Noord and Coda Octopus, it was concluded that far more could be obtained from the interaction between the excavator, the rotator system and the echoscope. This eventually resulted in the current Coda Octopus construction monitoring software. After a block is placed in reach of the excavator by the V-loader, the block is rigged. The operator uses his GPS system to navigate the aquapod to its location in the placement grid. By using the rotator, the operator can rotate the block in the preferred orientation. When the block is placed and appears to be in good position, according to the echoscope, the block is fixed by the operator. Next, the chain is disconnected by releasing a locking pin on the rotator. The coordinates of the center of gravity of the block and other relevant data, such as time of placement, are registered within the software. Placement underwater is carried out with an adapted hydraulic excavator with a custom-made exceptionally long stick in order to reach the flatbed level and up to about 3 meters under the water surface. For the first row placed on the flat berm, the correct spacing between two units is of major importance to provide proper space for units to be placed in the rows above. On the echoscope screen, the operator can see the aquapod to be placed, as well as parts of some previously placed aquapods, so he can determine the preferred position of the block. If the visibility is sufficient, underwater cameras can help to determine the configuration of placed blocks and slope. To place blocks in the area from about 3 meters underwater up to the waterline, an adapted excavator with a shorter stick is used. The area around the waterline is most critical. At the same time, placement of the aquapod just below the waterline is most difficult. For placement above the waterline, a standard excavator is used. Placement is visually by the operator and the rigger, whilst placement above the waterline is done without physical interaction between the rigger and the aquapod. Weather is one of the major challenges that we face during the construction time of a breakwater. It is unpredictable and in most cases our breakwaters are built in areas which incur frequent wave attacks. During construction it can happen works need to be halted due to adverse weather conditions. An uncompleted panel is more vulnerable to damage than a panel which has been built up till above the waterline and is supported by a tow berm. The video camera is a perfect tool in clear water but performance heavenly depends on visibility. 
when construction work like shaping of the underlayer or dumping of core material is carried out in the vicinity of the area where armor units are placed, it will have a negative effect on the camera imagery. The echoscope is ideal when visibility is poor, but it takes time to learn how to interpret the picture. The equipment used for the slope preparation plays an important role within the construction process. Hydraulic excavators are more suitable for profiling the underlayer compared to crawler cranes. The mechanical soundings are often carried out with the bucket of an hydraulic excavator. However, a multi-beam survey or survey carried out with the echoscope will reveal much better detail and will provide full coverage. Slope preparation plays an essential role and the better the slope is prepared, the faster the armor units can be placed. Placement rules for the various types of armor units have a lot of resemblances and all aim to obtain a stable armoring. The positioning system aids during the placement of the armor units and ensures all are placed within the set placement tolerances. The most accurate positioning can be obtained when using a hydraulic excavator in combination with the rotor system. A GNSS RTK positioning heading system is mounted at the back of the excavator in combination with pitch and roll sensors to register the attitude of the excavator body. Inclinometers are mounted on the boom and the stick of the excavator to measure the angle with respect to the horizon. Eventually this will provide an accurate XYZ position at the end of the stick with an accuracy of approximately 5 cm. The first row of blocks must be placed as accurately as possible. The maximum tolerance with respect to the target will be the height of the block divided by 12. There is no tolerance with respect to the target for the higher rows. Interlocking the block with the row below is given priority. Weather remains unpredictable and can lead to disruption in the breakwater construction process or in the worst case damage the new built structure. Wave conditions have a significant influence on the placing production. Echoscope performance near the waterline will be reduced to the acoustic noise and turbulence caused by the breaking waves. The underlayer must be suitable for placing the armor units and must comply in every respect with the tolerances defined. A full coverage survey using an echoscope could point out small defects which can then be reshaped. Slope preparation plays an essential role. The utilization of the excavator with rotor system and GNSS RTK positioning enables us to accurately place armor units. In combination with the echoscope, this innovative approach to breakwater construction has led to increased production efficiency and improved safety. Thank you for your attention. Thanks Richard for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, my name is Blair Cunningham and I'm President of Technology for Code Octopus. I want to add my personal thanks to Dave Anglin from Baird and Eric Peters uh, from Van Ord for their excellent contribution and I uh, hope everyone's found the webinar useful uh, thus far. Where I want to first start is uh, just give an overview of what I'll be touching on, uh, which is the introduction, background, you know, how the CMS came to be. Uh, then we'll look at some of the key equipment and options that you can have in setting up a CMS system. Then we'll look at you know, what is the CMS compared to perhaps other machine control systems that are available in the market today. And lastly, we'll touch on some of the key features that CMS offers, not only to the construction team, project managers, uh, critically the crane operators in this case, uh, and also as part of an end deliverable to the client. So where did it all begin? Well, Echoscope is our unique real-time three-dimensional imaging sonar. It's unlike any other technology that's available in the market today and uh, I'll discuss later how that differs from perhaps typical multi-beam or scanning sonars. But Van Ord uh, first tried the Echoscope back in 2008. Uh, it was on the Raslafan port expansion project in Qatar. 
and they had struggled with placement uh, production rates uh, and had looked at other technologies such as multi-beam sonar, uh, underwater video cameras, in addition to the usual and typical diver-aided placement. It was a large project and given the size and scale of the project, uh, Van Orr were very keen to look at a technology that could enhance productivity, increase safety and give them a, a better underwater vision uh, so that they could place blocks more accurately. So there was a number of key requirements that came out of that project um, and some of those still stand true today. Um, they needed to be able to visualize moving blocks in low to zero visibility water. Uh, often, uh, as many people that have been on breakwaters will understand, breakwaters are there for a reason. Uh, they're in, generally not in the, the nicest of calmest of waters. So there's a huge amount of cavitation and sediment generally in the water column. Um, ultimately, what they were looking for, though, was an accurate 3D scene that allowed them and the crane operator, ultimately, to place blocks uh, to meet the fairly strict uh, placement guidelines that are set in place by the block manufacturers. Um, divers uh, were the traditional method and still uh, generally involved in most breakwater designs, but we need to increase diver safety. We need to, to reduce the reliance on the divers and, and subsequently their time in water. Uh, Clearly, a diver cannot be effective during the hours of darkness, and that was another driver to try and see how they could get 24-hour operation in some of these large project sites. The blocks themselves, um, they needed to be able to increase the rate of which the, the blocks were being placed. Um, obviously, the efficiency of time between block pickup and placement, and the accuracy and repeatability of those block placements. Uh, Fundamentally, at the end of the day, all of the block movements, repairs, uh, final placements needed to be recorded as a final deliverable for the end client. So let's discuss quickly some of the equipment and options that can go into a construction monitoring system uh, solution package. So I mentioned uh, our Echoscope, uh, which is our real-time 3D imaging sonar, and that absolutely is at the heart of our CMS system. It's a patented, uh, world-unique technology, and what uh, makes that different to any other sonar on the market is it's what we call a volumetric multi-beam. So uh, we can image typically 50 degrees by 50 degrees as a field of view directly in front of the sonar uh, up to 12 frames a second. So it can be thought of something similar to an underwater camera except we have full three-dimensional data which we can use to create bathymetric maps, we can use that three-dimensional data to make real-time measurements and as I'll discuss later what we use that information for is to track an acropod or an X block or whatever the concrete uh, block is in front of us in real time. Now the other key thing here is unlike scanning sonars or traditional multi-beam sonars, they all require accurate positioning and attitude data in order to create a sensible uh, you know, image. Uh, the echoscope with no GPS or anything can still generate that fully georeferenced image 12 frames a second. So to put that into context, um, the image on the top right that you can see is a typical multi-beam, so it's a narrow, uh, a long track swath, um, and then the echoscope is giving us this full volume. So in this case, we're looking at vertical pilings, uh, assume that that could also be a block hanging in the water column. And when we transmit a single pulse, uh, out, we will be able to image or pick up any objects in the water column directly inside that 50 degrees by 50 degree field of view. The other benefit here is that not only can we see static images, but because we are imaging up to 12 frames a second, anything that's physically moving in the water column, we will also be able to see frame to frame. So, uh, what we're showing here is uh, the use of the echoscope with full position and attitude on the right-hand side. I'm creating a high-resolution map 
in real time, or on the left hand side, I'm actually walk, watching, uh, in this case, an X block uh, rotating under the water column. So both of these images are created in real time. This is what the operator would see. Uh, and on the image on the left hand side requires no additional equipment and on the right hand side it's the same traditional position and attitude sensors as would be required from a multi-beam. The unique thing here being uh, I can choose if I want to watch a moving object or create a map with the same sensor uh, mounted under the water column and that's one of the key things that we can bring to breakwater construction. So to break the key components of CMS down and how they relate to the level of accuracy of positioning equipment that you may bring in, I've created a table here so we start at the top when we have no positioning whatsoever. So I have no GPS, I simply have the echoscope underwater looking at a block. Then we can do uh, our, what we call our 3D camera mode. So I'm watching the, splint, the spinning block in real time. We can also track that block, so we can add a model to the back of the image data that we have, and I'll cover that later. And that gives the operator a uh, better reference about where that block will touch down on the under layer, on the slope. We can also do 3D block positioning, so this is where we can record the final resting place of the block, uh, its as laid position. And we can also build a full three-dimensional map or an as-built bathymetry model. Uh, we can also scan the breakwater slope prior to placing any blocks, and that will give us our underlayer, uh, which will give us, for example, any higher low spots. And traditionally, that work is carried out maybe by multi-beam or single beam currently. So as you move up the accuracy of your positioning equipment up to the full level where we would have GPS, INS, so high accuracy RTK position uh, with some level of uh, motion reference unit, then we can provide the full spectrum of pre-survey, block tracking, block positioning, and then building a full as laid uh, deliverable map with the echoscope underwater. As Eric mentioned, the frame equipment uh, that you would mount the echoscope on is largely down to the scope of the project, the size of the blocks and the breakwater design that you have. But uh, typically it's recognised that uh, wire cranes or crawler cranes are more challenging to place blocks with any level of dexterity. Having said that, the echoscope is as comfortable on either platform and really what we require if you want to implement the full capability of CMS is an accurate position of where the echoscope is. So on a crawler crane, wire crane, that may involve GPS antennas at the top of the boom and then a cable payout meter to give us the, uh, the Z uh, location down to the mounting frame. Uh, Van Orr did create a very innovative design with their excavators, however, uh, and that not only gave us very accurate positioning, but it also allowed them the capability to rotate the block underwater. The two key parameters that we find useful, however, and it's worth consideration, are the length of the frame, so that's, the, that's the, really the distance between the pinpoint where the block is hanging underneath and where the echoscope is situated, and then the angle of the echoscope that's mounted. The rationale behind that is that we need to be able to adjust the field of view that the echoscope can see so that we can see at least 50% of the neighboring blocks in the same view as you have the active block hanging during positioning. But it also allows you to see more of the underlay and the area around where you may place the next block. So this angle and the length are important considerations uh, that perhaps require adjustment as you move up the slope and also as you change the sizes of blocks if you have varying block sizes in the project. So here's a, an example about how we would take our positioning input. So here everything is related to what we call pin position. So if your machine control system or if your navigation system can measure accurately to that pin position, then we will take uh, fixed X, Y and Z offsets down to the centre of the echoscope array. And then we can add additional uh, pitch and roll sensors 
if that frame will move independently of the excavator uh, pin arm. Ultimately, what we're looking to try and do is to give us as accurate a position of where the echoscope is looking, such that when we track a block, we can infer its accurate position on the seabed relative to the pre-laid design positions. So what's an optimum setup? Well, typically uh, and very laterally, we've been working uh, with Van Ord and, and other companies, and we have found that the excavator model uh, is being the most reliable, easiest to set up and to control and get repeatability from. You know, that will give us a dual GPS heading bundle on the a cab itself of the excavator, and then a variety of angle sensors through the machine control interface to give us that derived pin position. In addition, what we have uh, introduced is another product which we call our ISAR, or Integrated Single Access Rotator. The Echoscope can then be mounted to this ISAR, and that allows uh, as you move up the various rows on the breakwater, it allows you to adjust subtly any angle movement, which I mentioned in the prior slide, so that you don't have to bring the whole excavator out of the water and adjust a mechanical bracket. So the ISAR unit gives us that real-time, on-the-fly look. The hidden benefit, and a, a nice benefit, however, is that the excavator can go back into the water with a uh, no block attached, and then using the ISAR unit, it can pan or uh, rotate up the breakwater and provide a complete as current designed uh, you know, bathymetry map of the situation of where you're looking. So what is CMS? So for CMS, we set ourselves a goal to uh, provide enough information for the entire work team constructing a breakwater from design through to the end deliverable to the client. So unlike some machine control systems where you are recording only a portion of the placement, um, we want to try and take, uh, as I say, the initial design, the prelay, the slope design information, be able to place blocks individually, monitor any subsequent movements of those blocks or perhaps any collisions during the placement of a block, be able to watch and recover a block, come back to the surface uh, with generally the aid of a diver, and be able to survey the slope with either blocks in location, blocks partly in location, or no blocks and just assessing the under layer. And then recording all of that information into a final deliverable report. So how does CMS differ or compare to perhaps other solutions? Um, I definitely think this is a growing market. As I say, we've been involved in this space since 2008. And since that point, you know, there's a number of other notable players coming to the market. Generally, these are around what we call machine control solutions, where they are looking to derive the block position from GPS or additional sensors, for example, like a motion reference unit. And some fairly advanced solutions are available on, on the market at the moment. Before we see uh, they don't offer, uh, other than for the placement or the reporting side, is the key uh, part in the middle, which hopefully Eric has been able to uh, you know, convey in his discussion, which is that you know, great if you can place a block first time every time, but you don't know if you have had a collision with a neighboring block and moved it out of location. You can't see that because there's no visual interface. You can obviously use that sensor to recover the block and, and relocate it. And neither can you really generate any level of survey data. So and survey data, I mean uh, some bathymetry data. Is the underlayer intact? Is there holes in the underlayer? Are there boulders in the way that would prevent you from placing a block? So. We like to try and cover the entire uh, work scope perspective. So for CMS, uh, yes, we can provide at all times a complete 3D real-time visualization of the complete scene. So that's not only the active block, but also the neighboring blocks. At the most base level, we can do that with no GPS. Uh, and this is where the 50 degree field of view and the distance between the echoscope and the active block, the length measurement I mentioned, comes into play. 
what we're trying to show the operator is as they approach the target location, they can see the neighboring blocks, they can see the orientations of how those blocks have been finally rested and know how to place the active block into its correct place. We can also take that sonar data, and this is something we created at the back end of 2008, uh, a very unique and again patented uh, uh, tracking algorithm where we use the real-time three-dimensional data. There's no additional sensors on the blocks themselves. We're using the three-dimensional data and we're able to compute where that block is both in XYZ space but also as full rotation. In doing so, we can then on our system display a computer model of what that block is and the important fact of that is that wh why do we need that? Well from the Echoscope's perspective we're looking at the block looking towards the slope but in some cases for placement you need to look from the side so you can see where the back of the block is and when it's going to touch the slope. So that allows us to create that visual experience for the operators. So. The CMS block tracking, as we have, is a very important component of our CMS. Uh, not only can we uh, see static blocks as the block is moving, uh, you know, in Van Ord's situation, of course, they're able to rotate the block. Uh, we're able to track that in real time. But we can also go back and look at an area of a breakwater where you have previously laid blocks look to see if our tracked final resting position is now, does that now correlate with its, uh, the real-time sonar data we're seeing, and if not, reacquire the block's position and update the tracking database to represent. And that absolutely is a unique thing that we can do. Uh, I remember numerous phone calls um, you know, and discussions with, uh, with various construction companies who have had weather damage, uh, they've had to stand down operations, and one of the things the Echoscope can do very quickly and swiftly is assess the breakwater uh, you know, for it being intact, are the blocks in the same position as we left them and what do we need to do to update the database. So the CMS or construction monitoring system it is a complete project management system so it incorporates all the plan design layout information if you have DXF or GeoTIFF drawings or XYZ data we can bring that into the full 2D 3D GIS system that we have on board. Uh, the block tracking, which I've just discussed as well, is significant for the crane operator. But it's also significant to go back and to document and to understand if blocks have shifted uh, after some event or it could easily be, uh, you know, as we have seen and witnessed ourselves, you get to a certain row and suddenly the tool block gives away and some of those blocks slide down. If you're using a positioning only system, you would not know that that had happened, that event had happened, and you would continue placing blocks uh, until there was a diver operation. And a diver, uh, typically in these situations, is a very short range of, uh, of visual view, so he can't stand back and look at the you know, 50 feet by 50 foot uh, panel of, uh, of the breakwater to understand have all the blocks shifted, is there now gaps where there was no gaps before. So ultimately what we're trying to provide is uh, a full as laid database so we track every single unique block ID. We have its original intent or pre-lay position. We have the as laid position with a full date and time. And if we need to go back because that block has moved, then we can update that tracking position so we have a full history of all the block movements or repositioning. Uh, the as-built survey uh, can also be recorded, so think of that as a traditional, uh, very high resolution bathymetry map of the breakwater. And again, because the Echoscope has this large field of view, not a, a thin slice of data, we can fill in a lot of the shadows and the gaps that are generally provenant uh, in typical multi-beam or scanning sonar uh, data results. So let's uh, look at uh, CMS as a solution overview and what that can provide. So the CMS application is a full featured uh, but very customizable uh, user interface uh, such that you know our surveyor that's interested in assessing the block placement uh, as that progresses may want to see more information and more detail than the crane operator who's trying to lay blocks accurately and wants to focus just on that task in hand. 
So there's four key sets of data I'm showing on this current video uh, that we're watching moving. We're watching the real-time echoscope sonar data, uh, which is uh, represented by A. Now, this is actually being colored relative to height above a berm design. So because we have full three-dimensional data, as I say, we can use that information uh, to color or to make real-time measurements. So here, the gray color area represents the underlayer. And if there was anything in the underlayer that was of a different color, moving into that browning color, then that may represent a boulder that was a high spot on the, on the berm design before placement. For the letter B, what we're looking at, the color spheres represent all the prelay positions of, uh, of each unique ID that we need to place. Uh, in this particular example, we've just displayed them all. Uh, C, in this case, I've actually chosen not to display the sonar data in the main view, and I'm only displaying the track block model. Now, to some operators, this may give them a clearer view, but we've still got the backup of seeing the full three-dimensional data such that if I hit the block to the left of me, I would be able to see that physically happening in the sonar data window. We also have a side profile view, which lets me see the forward and back motion of the breakwater of the block against the breakwater berm. And finally, uh, D represents the previous blocks that I've marked and laid on my design. And again, you can turn all of these things on and off. Uh, or make them transparent or fully transparent uh, to suit the particular uh, operator's requirements and needs. So, at a base level, um, if people do not require um, full documentation or reporting, the CMS can actually still be used with no GPS. So this particular data set I'm looking at here has no GPS, we are tracking a block in real time. We're watching that block. I've, I've overlaid the model in this particular case now on top of the 3D echoscope data. And so what I'm demonstrating here are two modes. We have the 3D camera modes, so my real time visualization, but also my 3D block tracking. So at this base level, because I've no GPS, what I can't do is mark the block as laid and compute its final position because I have no real world coordinates coming in. But as you can see, I can still look at neighboring blocks as sonar data and see my active block as a model which would help me infer its resting position. Moving forward to what we call the full capability system, um, what we have in addition uh, to the previous slide I showed you, so we have full GPS and attitude data coming in here. So we're looking at the active block being tracked. I have my small side uh, sonar data window. Uh, obviously, because of all our data is three-dimensional, I could rotate and move the display around to see different aspects or, or profiles. Typically, a crane operator is unlikely to do this. They, their two hands and two feet are generally busy at all times. So what we also provide them is, if we have our prelay data, the, the feature on the bottom left of the screen is giving me a radius view around the active block that we're trying to place. And it gives me a traffic light system, so red, uh, amber, green, uh, in terms of my placement accuracy. And it's computing based upon the centroid position of the block, am I in the right location of where that block needs to be? We also get um, error in terms of uh, northern eastings and both height deltas away from the final position. So we've got some great information here for the operator, not only the live sonar view, have I hit something, why can't I get that block into position, I have my CGI models, but I also have this placement tool that will give me an accurate and definitive way to try and get that block into the right target. So before I release the block, I know that I have it on the design target. So, giving you some other options, um, we, the operator's 3D view can be com combined how they like really. Uh, the echoscope can, can be just the data only, so I'm looking at the data just there on the left hand side. Uh, this is the same block uh, that we're looking at, but just represented in three different ways. Uh, the center image has given me almost all the features enabled, so I have acoustic data from the echoscope, we have the block tracking enabled, and we also have my pre-lay and as-laid models. 
And then the image on the right, we've simply just, from the main view, disabled the sonar data. But typically, you would also still have that small thumbnail of sonar data that you could reference. So this is somewhat about setting the expectation for the crane operators who really, by and large, are vital uh, link in the chain for the accurate placement of breakwater. So we want to try and provide them as much information, real-time information, not just all synthetic data, uh, so that they can make the accurate decisions. So in addition to allowing the user to bring in prelay information into the project, uh, one of the other nice features is the ability to bring in a berm design. So we use the information from the berm design uh, not only as additional visual context, but we use that as a surface to compute the colors that we represent the sonar data from. So what you'll see is the blocks that are physically placed on the seabed are kind of an orange color in this example. Uh, the block hanging in the water column is a white going to orange as it approaches the uh, location. And then gray is the representing color of, that should match the entire berm design. So if we look at a location on the berm and we see a color uh, that is uh, of orange or going to white, or even up to blue, then what we will know immediately from that is that the berm, uh, the physical berm, is now not matching the design tolerance. So we could have a high spot, um, or there could be some other object that's uh, in the way that would pre prevent really uh, accurate placement. To take that a stage further and to give you a better example, here what we have actually done is we've taken the berm design and the berm is the color of blue in this case, just for uh, to show it in, in greater context, is we're actually cutting through the sonar data. And now you can see all the individual rocks and boulders that are above the tolerance of the berm design. Here, in this particular example, we're actually watching uh, echoscope placement from a block that's uh, probably about 30 meters away, uh, which is why the block looks much smaller than the prior examples. We allow, as mentioned previously, the ability to import a prelay file. These are standard uh, comma-separated uh, text files. You can then export uh, both the as-laid file or bring in as-laid files from other excavators. So the idea being is you have a master project, you could have multiple excavators with CMS running on each one, and you can bring the data nightly or however, however often you want over into the master machine and that would bring all of the data together and bring all the as laid information. CMS is backed by a large scale GIS database so all of my track information, all of my block information is recorded uh, in a spatial engine. Uh, here I'm able to measure between the centroid of uh, any of my as laid blocks to the center of the prelay. We have all of that information in a database, but visually here I'm allowed to make some instant measurements. What we can also do is double click on any of the as laid uh, data and we'll immediately get the block ID. So a project manager, for example, is able to quickly go and double click on any of these blocks, find out when it was placed, what was its accuracy tolerance based upon the prelay information. A key differentiator of CMS and with the Echoscope and its innovative block tracking technology it not only is for the active placement of blocks as they're in the water column, but too often we see that blocks have been uh, moved during placement of neighboring blocks, the underlayer has given away, and the blocks have moved as a consequence. Now, rather than having to pick these blocks back up, with a positioning only system that would be almost impossible. A diver perhaps might be able to get a positional fix. But what we're able to do here is we could immediately go in with the excavator, look at the panel, 
I can then edit the position of any of those blocks. So here I've selected a block, I moved it out of the way, and then I've asked the system to reacquire the block's position from the static uh, Echoscope data. So we can do that at any time. The other thing that would become obvious to you is if you then did a survey of the panel with the Echoscope, again just using the same excavator and its positioning, it would become obvious to notice that the model data would be out of place with the sonar data. So in summary what I want to do just to uh, run over some of the key points that I've hopefully been able to demonstrate in this very short uh, CMS uh, overview in this webinar and uh, I would encourage anyone who uh, wants to discuss with us further uh, to reach out to the sales team and uh, we can spend some more time go through the actual physical software and some of the prior projects that we've been working with. Um, Key points I think to take away here are, you know, the Echoscope provides the ability to instantly visualize what is happening. Uh, a positioning only solution only tells you about the device or the object that it is monitoring. It can't tell you about anything else that's surrounding that. Um, I think we've seen enough breakwater projects where uh, clearly, you know, things don't go according to plan as well. Uh, this is a challenging environment. So uh, giving the operator better visual control on the entire situation and some numerical three-dimensional data allows people to execute the task and to monitor the situation far far more readily. I think uh, being able to use the Xscope also as a survey tool, do that pre-lay survey, compare that to the design intent, look for high spots that could have been damaged to the underlayer before you even start to place a block. Um, Clearly, the guide for the operator has got to be as simplistic as possible, so we're trying again to present as many options for the crane operator uh, so that they can do the task at hand, which is to place the block in a known location uh, with the correct attitude that fits around the surrounding blocks. So, ultimately, we're looking for accurate block placement. We're looking to see the neighboring blocks. Do we have that required interlocking? Let's look at the next block once I've placed my active block so I can understand the space profile before I move on and sling the next block up. That's vital. Um, you can assume how you think the block has been placed and even after release we often see, and this is why we continue to track the block until it's steady, the block will move. As soon as the sling comes out, the block will move. So a positioning only system that perhaps has a, an MRU attached to the block, when you rip that from the block, the block most likely will settle into a different orientation. Um, and full set of deliverables again, we've not only got survey data, so three-dimensional survey data, but we also have the full project set of data. So that is our prelay information, our design berm information, and where we are in terms of as laid information compared to the requirement or the pre-designed positions. I want to just leave you with some other thought. Um, most of the attendees here, I'm going to assume, are in the construction, uh, marine construction uh, industry. And the Echoscope has been used, as we said right at the beginning, not just for uh, breakwater design, but any task where you're doing a repetitive uh, process, so that could be mattress placement, that could be pipe lay, it could be cable lay, and the Exco really does open up the opportunity for people to do things in a different way. I think the traditional method of survey data with a multi-beam, uh, I'll then get an image, maybe after a day or so, then we can plan and execute a task based upon that static data, and then we go back to see if we did it okay. Now that's typically the process. Um, what we're looking to try and offer uh, is giving you the ability to continuously monitor the situation. So before I place that mattress, for example, in the water column, I could be seeing the target area, I can make sure there's no high spots, I can make sure there's no boulders there, there's nothing in the way. I can monitor the mattress coming all the way down to the seafloor, and then once the mattress is on the seafloor, I can take a few pings of data, and now I have my post-lay information. So operating from a barge, uh, let's say for example, I can collect my pre-lay, my post-lay, and monitor the entire operation with a single sensor, uh, without having to bring a secondary survey vessel in. So, 
uh, again, driven here, what we're trying to say is the survey or the imaging component, uh, if you're using the X-scope, can now be 100% involved when it becomes a, a critical construction asset. Uh, ultimately, we'll save time and money, but it also will improve safety and quality, clearly. And here is just a, a typical life cycle of what we are trying to do, and uh, we call this real-time 3D dynamic survey. So it's a survey that is constantly evolving with the uh, continual construction that would happen in that particular uh, in that particular application. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. I really appreciate everyone signing in, and I'll hand back over to Richard. Thank you Dave, Eric and Blair for three very comprehensive and detailed presentations. I'd now like to quickly summarise the key points from each of the presentations before we move on to the question and answer session. From Dave's presentation on the design process, we learnt that the more exposed locations require interlocking armour units. We learnt that quality construction is essential to the long-term performance of the breakwater and that tight interlocking, orientation and correct placement of the armour layer is essential to the success of the project. From Eric's presentation on the challenges facing the construction process, we saw that weather and waves will have a significant effect on the water visibility and the ability to use divers on the project. We saw that slope preparation is essential ensuring the breakwater meets the design intent and that block placement, orientation and interlocking must meet the designer's specified rules. Eric showed us how the input of survey sensors and the echoscope can improve the production rate and the safety on the project. And finally, from Blair's presentation on the construction monitoring software, we learned that the CMS software is combined with the Code Octopus real-time 3D echoscope sonar system, that this system enables block visualization and block tracking, it enables the correct orientation and interlocking of the blocks to be visualised by the operator. The system also enables the survey of the pre-lay slope and the post-lay breakwater to be completed by the operator. And it is capable of monitoring of movement of blocks once they have been installed. Overall, the system has the ability to improve and increase the production rate and the safety on the project. Thank you once again to all the presenters for their input into today's webinar. We will now be able to take the questions that have been submitted via the, via the chat bar at the bottom of the webinar homepage. Once again, if you have any further questions, please just, just submit these via this uh, chat bar and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you.